Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and uh, welcome to this month's seminar. Uh, it, this month we're going to talk about something that every senior should talk about um, because when you get to be our age, and by the way, I'm uh, turned 72 this year, I get it. Uh, when you get to be our age, you realize that your life is finite, um, that you may have some years to live, you may have a lot of years to live, but, it, but you have kind of a limited number of years to live. And, and so the goal is to help you think about what you need to think about uh, at this time in terms of kind of the end of your life, but not just the end of your life, really the last year of your life. Now, I always talk about my friends Frank and Mary uh, and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. And their goal in life was always and remains to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. Uh, now, if, and Frank and Mary in today's uh, example are 75 years old. If that's the case, then Frank has an actuarial life expectancy right now of, of, uh, of a little over 11 years and Mary has a life expectancy of uh, almost 13 years. In other words, uh, using the standard, the, the national life expectancy charts, if Frank is 75 right now, he should live until he is 86 or he is actuarially likely to live until he's 86 and Mary is actuarially likely to live until she's 87. But of course, you know, stuff happens. Uh, it, you, Frank right now may be living the last year of his life because he could get hit by a truck tomorrow or Mary could fall into the swimming pool and then that's that and then your life is over. Um, so there's always that possibility. Of course, those are really remote possibilities. And of course, as far as Frank and Mary is concerned, they're, if you ask them, well, um, you know, you know you're going to die. How, you know, what, are you, what are you thinking? And they'll really say, well, really, you know, we want to die. We want to both fall asleep in bed and never wake up, you know. And that is, you know, and, and if that's what they hope for or maybe what they pray for. Um, but prayer is kind of not an option, right? This, that may be what happens, but it is extremely unlikely. Uh, I have, so I do nothing but elder law work, and so... I deal with a lot of folks who are frail or dying or die. And I actually have on average about one of my clients dies about every two weeks. I have about 2000 clients and they're all seniors. And so, you know, kind of do the math. That means that somebody is going to be dying probably pretty regularly. I have not seen a single person uh, who simply was doing great and healthy and just died in bed. Not in the last year, maybe over the last five years, there was one person who, who, oh my God, you know, we went to find Ma and, you know, she was feeling great and all of a sudden she's dead. Well, no, that's not how you die. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, about death, about that last year in relation to how you might die. So the most common causes of death are cancer, Alzheimer's disease, uh, heart attacks or strokes. Uh, and uh, failure to thrive. What is failure to thrive? If you talk to medical folks, uh, they will tell you that when they're dealing with seniors, for every senior who is not otherwise dying of a specific thing, cancer is killing them, they just had their fifth stroke, you know, um, um, the folks at some age will just start breaking down. Uh, things will just stop working as well as they were working before. One thing leads to another. You've got one problem that leads to some other problem. You get pneumonia, you come back, you're not feeling great. They refer to that as failure to thrive. It's just kind of a code term for you're probably going to be dying at some time soon. And in the meantime, your body is kind of preparing for that, right? Now, in, all, in three out of these four cases, uh, everything except heart attack and stroke, um, your death is going to come after some period of time. So there's going to be a period of time where you're going to be experiencing the last year of your life. It used to be when we were growing up that in the case of heart attack or stroke, that wasn't the case. Remember when we were, we were growing up, you'd hear that someone had a heart attack and they just died, you know, and, and some, or someone had a stroke and they just died. The statistic is that back in 1970, um, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your likelihood of living for another, it, more than another couple of weeks was 30, was, uh, or for living, or, um, was like 33%, excuse me, your likelihood of dying within the next couple of weeks was 33%. That statistic is now 3%, 3%. Uh, because if you have a stroke or a heart attack, 
There are EMTs, there's ambulances, there's life flights, there's stents, there's all this stuff that keeps you from dying. Now, you're not gonna feel as good as you were before that heart attack or that stroke, chances are, right? You're gonna be weakened. Uh, and the typical course for folks who have those diseases is they'll have events, they'll recover, but not to the extent they were recovered before, and then they'll have another event, and they'll, be go, they'll go downhill. So, so in, in, in most cases, the vast majority of cases, you're gonna have a period of time before you die where you're gonna be frail. Um, and there are different measures of frail. Frail may be bedridden. Frail may be just having trouble getting around and so you're using a walker all the time and you're needing to sit down more because you're really tired. There are a whole number of things that could define frail. But what I, what I guess I'm suggesting is that you wanna be prepare, prepared for the possibility that you may become frail. And while you could postpone all of that until later, until you're actually frail, it has been my experience that people who do that find themselves causing themselves and their family a whole lot of stress that really wouldn't have been necessary if they had been paying attention to this stuff or had a sense of this before they got frail. So I wanna talk about that. So, so how can you kind of prepare to be frail? Um, well, one, first you wanna kind of know who the potential home care providers may be for you if you get frail. Because if you get frail, it may be that you're gonna need somebody to help you out at home. Now, one possibility, and the most common one cited by my clients, is their kids. Oh, my kids are gonna help me out. I know they've, you know, they've always told me they're gonna help me out. And that's great. And it may be that they will help you out. It has been my experience that typically when you hear those words from kids, you can count on the girls more than the boys, just kind of in general. Um, I have more, a lot more designated daughters in the world than I have designated sons. Certainly, if you're Frank and Mary, you have vowed you're gonna take care of each other, right? Sickness and in health. Except that remember, Frank and Mary are about the same age. So if one of them is getting sick, there's a really good chance that at that age, the other one isn't feeling so great either. And that even if they're feeling okay, they may not have just the physical strength or the stamina to take care of the other spouse all the time. I always tell my clients, they have many clients who are, for example, taking care of um, a, um, a spouse who has dementia. And I'll always tell these clients, you know, the worst thing that you can do for your husband or your wife is to drop dead, which is what happens. You know, people will not necessarily drop dead as we were talking, but they'll have a heart attack or they'll have a stroke and become really weakened from overexertion taking care of the spouse. So you want to kind of know who those home care providers are in your area so that you'd have a sense of like who to call. Um, second, you want to be kind of looking at your house. Remember Frank and Mary's goal is to live in their house until they die. But remember their, their needs when they're living in that house may change if they get, start getting frail. The second floor of the house may end up becoming useless if you can't get up the stairs or if you're, you can get up the stairs but you're worried that then you might fall down the stairs, right? <clears throat> remember the washer dryer that's like in the basement? No, that's not gonna work if you're getting frail. I actually had clients well, this was an unusual case. I had, I had a, uh, two clients who actually did die within relatively short, uh, short uh, in, um, close to each other. Um, one of them basically died falling down the stairs to the basement to go get the laundry, and the other died um, shortly there actually, after actually also falling down the stairs. So you wanna make sure that the house is such that you can live in it safely. I always tell people, it's great that you want to live in your house as long as it's safe because you don't want that fall in your house to cause you to be in this frail stage for longer than you have to be or to just or to die. So you want to be looking at the house. You want to be figuring out whether there are any kinds of repairs to the house that you want to be doing um, because something's just not working now or modifications so that the house will be equipped um, to handle things if you get frail. At the very least, the, one of the reasons for kind of figuring this stuff out is you can get a sense of the cost of doing that stuff. For example, as a, the example I often give is that folks, um, w w this, there was always this issue of getting to the second floor and one option was always an elevator, but people would say an elevator and roll their eyes and that's how much is that? It's not like, and it used to be, it was like $150,000, huge cost for an elevator. 
I've now, well, we have relatives um, actually who live in, um, in uh, Maryland, the, the, the parents of my uh, son-in-law, um, who had, the, and one of the, one of the, 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 the wife has is, is gotten frail, and so they installed an elevator in their house, standard issue, you know, kind of a four bedroom colonial, uh, and it cost them like $40,000, and it's this wonderful elevator, and it blends in architecturally. So the point is, there are these adaptations that you would not necessarily know about if you're not in the construction industry, right? Or in the industry that is dealing with helping seniors figure out uh, how to modify their home. So you wanna think about that. Um, third, you wanna figure out whether, and this may apply because you're getting frail now or you're just thinking you, know, you may in the future, you may wanna look around at the assisted living communities um, that have sprung up around you. Um, 20, I remember my mother ended up dying in a nursing home back in the 1990s, but back then there were no options to home other than a nursing home, right? You remember assisted living, what in the world was that? Well now, I don't wanna say that they're everywhere, but there are a lot of assisted living communities um, in a lot of areas. I know that for my, for my, uh, my folks who live on uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, where I do a lot of work, your options on assisted livings are more limited unless you're willing to, to move off the island. There is a wonderful place uh, on Nantucket called Sherburn Commons. Um, there isn't another kind of regular assisted living um, on uh, Martha's Vineyard um, right now, uh, although there is a wonderful place called the Henrietta Brewer House if you're really getting frail. But the point is you wanna look at what your options are and just kind of be realistic about those options, right? And you want to be thinking, so at that point, is that the point at which you would want to be moving closer to one of your children? Not necessarily in with one of your children, if you want to keep your privacy, but in an assisted living community that's closer to one of your children. I know that there are several of assisted living communities that have been built uh, in the area, in Marlboro, in the area around Marlboro, where, where my wife and I live. Uh, and I know I had actually been involved in the permitting of many of those. And I remember initially the first ones that were proposed it was assumed that they were all gonna be occupied by local folks who just wanted to stay in the community. I know that the, the statistics actually are that most of these places are, are, the, are, are, are occupied primarily by folks who moved into this area to be close to one of their children. So you may wanna kind of look at what those options are. And finally, and I know this sounds like, a, like a, not a great time, to, to, but, but you may wanna look around at the nursing home possibilities. So that if you become um, frail to the ex extent that you really can't live safely, except in a place where there are, there are, there are nurses available all the time, um, you wanna kinda know what those options are. So you wanna kinda figure that out. You wanna, and, and by the way, I'm just gonna mention one other thing, which is the hospital. Uh, I know many people moved away from this area in their earlier retirement uh, and then moved back because, they, they, because the medical care in this area is so good. And I know even on the islands, you know, even on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, I know they kind of, you bemoan the fact that you're, you're in an island and there's only the small hospital, but both hospitals are connected uh, and owned by Mass General Brigham so that you've got the, you know, fairly uh, quick access to unbelievably good care. So you wanna kind of be figuring that part out. So you wanna, you wanna get that right. And then you wanna build your own team. You wanna make sure that there are a set of players who can help you figure this out if you're having to go through this. And the three that I would really stress are first of all a geriatric care manager. Geriatric care managers, if you've never heard of this term, are folks who um, typically former nurses or social workers who've decided that that's what they wanna do for a living is help seniors develop and implement care plans. Um, and, and their job is to help you figure out for yourself and help your family work with you to figure out what you currently need or what you may need in the near future and then talk to you about what the options are. The great geriatric care manager is the one who is really living in or very close to the community, has dealt with all of the various care professionals, has gone to all the assisted livings, knows the nursing homes, knows the home care agencies, and can make some recommendations regarding what's, what's good and what isn't. So you really want a geriatric care manager. Um, a PCP is really important. Your primary care provider um, is, I know the primary care provider role has changed over the 
over our lives certainly, and certainly over the last 20 years, um, because increasingly the hospitals have become the, 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 the employers of a lot of, a lot of doctors, uh, and increasingly doctors have assembled into larger practices. But it, it, it would really, I'm sure that you're, you know, you're obviously con concerned about this yourself. You really want to be knowing that you have a primary care provider who you, whom you're comfortable with and who is interested in your needs. And if you don't have that, then you may want to move to a different primary care provider. And once again, you don't want to be, you don't want to be moving or trying to figure out how to move away from someone whom, with whom you're not comfortable in the middle of an emergency. You want to be dealing with that now. And finally, you probably want to talk to and get a re develop a relationship with an elder law attorney. That doesn't mean spending a boatload of money necessarily on new estate planning documents or any of this other stuff, but it means kind of getting to know somebody who specifically deals with seniors a lot and with the issues that seniors face. Once again, that's the kind of person that, that, that you or your, your spouse or your kids are gonna, be, are gonna be calling in an emergency. You would ideally like to know that in that emergency, that, that elder law professional already understands your situation and understands the family dynamic. Just, it's just gonna be very, very helpful. So the replacement that you need to know, then you need to know, or you should acquaint yourself with programs that may be relevant to you. And once again, uh, you could wait until you're frail in order to do this, or you could try to familiarize yourself with this ahead of time. There are a lot of programs, but I'm just going to talk about three. <clears throat> One, the so-called 60-day order. Um, Medicare, uh, and specifically Medicare A, which is the, the piece of Medicare for which there are, there are minimal uh, deductibles, <clears throat> covers a, a handful of basic services. One of them is the hospital. Um, uh, another, though, um, and, and by the way, Medicare also will cover a, a short stay in a nursing home. The idea behind uh, Medicare is that it's supposed to help you get better if you're sick. So if you're sick, they're going to they're gonna pay for the ad hospital um, give, uh, with some parameters. And then they're going to pay to help you get better if you need to go to a skilled nursing facility in order to get better. So they'll pay for up to 100 days. But in addition to that, <clears throat> there is a benefit which, of which many people are not aware, uh, through which uh, if your doctor certifies that you are homebound and therefore cannot go to the hospital uh, to get outpatient services, um, that the, the, um, the, the doctor, um, typically in, this, in, in conjunction with the Visiting Nurses Association or the nurse that you've worked with, um, can, pre can prescribe care to you at home. It can be nursing care, it can be physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, the care that is being provided, because it's being provided through Medicare, um, has to really have a medical component to it. So this is not a program that, is, that would help you if you needed simply home care because you needed help just kind of getting around the house or help with showering or toileting or whatever. But if you need more care than that, um, especially if you've had one of these medical problems, but not necessarily a problem that caused you to have to go to the hospital, then the doctor can prescribe one of these 60-day plans. These plans, if at the end of 60 days you still need help at the home, the doctor can extend that. So these can be 60-day uh, plans that extend literally infinitely into the future uh, and can provide not only, with you, not only with physical therapy, occupational therapy, but also durable medical equipment, things that you may need uh, if you are really homebound. Um, the second program, and the program that people so often just close their eyes or turn their heads or, oh, this isn't relevant to me, I'm not about to die, um, is the hospice program. So Medicare also provides a benefit specifically for people who have decided that, that they, not necessarily that they're going to die tomorrow, but that the care that they want is care that is going to provide, to provide for a better quality of their lives and maximize the quality of their lives versus care that is, provide, that is being provided to cure you, even if the, 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 the side effects of that cure is that you're really gonna be pretty miserable during the time that they're trying to cure you. So the hospice benefit is a great benefit 
Uh, if you're in that, par that part of your life, let's talk about the last year of your life, where you're feeling like, you know, you know I've, I've had cancer, I've had, I've, now I've come back. There, you know, our doctor is saying there are these aggressive forms of therapy that I can use, but you know, I, I know what that means. It's nausea and it's, it's weakness. I don't want to go there. In that situation, the hospice benefit is really a terrific benefit. Similarly, uh, if you're failing to thrive, do you, do you really want to be spending the last year of your life mostly in the hospital or mostly in and out of the hospital or in the hospital or in physical therapy and doing stuff? If you know that you're in the last year of your life, that you're not feeling great, that you just want your life to be as good as possible, that's where the hospice benefit can really help you. It can provide for a lot of care at home. Uh, it, it, in that case, can actually provide some home care folks. It does a, it's a really, it's a wonderful benefit. It also provides counseling to your family around dealing with any of these issues. So the key to this benefit is it's a Medicare benefit. So you're not paying for it. It's not out of pocket. It's Medicare. So there are no asset restrictions or anything else. And it's available to you if your doctor says that in, in the normal course of your, whatever you have, whether you, whether you are failing to thrive or whether you have a particular illness, that in the normal course of things that you may die within the next six months. So it's a benefit that, that is, is really useful to you in the last year of your life. You should remember though, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to die in order to get the benefit. You only have to have the doctor say that you may die within the next six months. So, and, and, and at the end of the, the six months, if you're still alive, that's okay. The doctor can simply extend this, right? As a matter of fact, I think there was a, a friend of mine told me a statistic that something like 28 or 30% of all people who get the hospice benefit graduate. Uh, that is, they get to the point where they're no longer using the hospice benefit anymore because they kind of get better. So don't assume that you just want to not even think about hospice because, oh my God, that's just if I'm about to die. You know, I, I, I'm tragically the, the typical um, hospice benefit patient uses hospice for less than 20 days. Um, and the benefit, once again, is available in six months in, month increments forever. So there's the hospice benefit. Finally, there's, mass, there's the, the Mass Health Frail Elder Waiver Program. Frail Elder Waiver Program is designed if you're Frank or Mary and you want to stay home and you don't want to go to a nursing home and, you're, and your doctor and, and, the, uh, and the, the folks at the ASAP, the Aging Services Access Point, which is Bay Path uh, Elder Services or Springwell here in the greater than Marlboro area, uh, it is Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. If in their opinion you can live safely at home, in that case, um, you can if you qualify for this, that benefit medically uh, and also financially, you can, Ma Mass Health, uh, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, will provide a lot of care for you at home um, as much as 40 hours a week. So it's an ideal benefit for someone who is frail, who has maybe a spouse or kids who are helping out so that they don't need 24 hour care. But they, knew, but they would really benefit from having some care every day. So it's a great benefit. So you should look at that. You can investigate that benefit now. It is an asset-based benefit. Um, so you, in order to qualify, the sick person has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. But if you're Frank and Mary, all of the assets can be shifted to the healthy spouse at the last minute before you're qualified. And as opposed to the nursing home benefit, which you cannot get if you've given away assets um, within the last five years. MassHealth at this point does not impose a, a look back period regarding assets that are transferred out to the non-spouse, say to the kids. So you can typically qualify for this benefit fairly quickly after you have trans, even if you've had some assets as long as you've transferred them away. So you want to talk about that. Um, finally, who is implementing this plan? Or, and, 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 well, basically it's you, right? But you want to make sure that if you're incapacitated that you have the documents. So the person implementing the plan is the person you trust. Th that relates to four documents. Your power of attorney. If the, your power of attorney is going to give somebody the ability to, to make medical or legal, or excuse me, to make legal decisions for you, financial and other, if you're incapacitated. Um, you need someone you can trust to do that. Typically it's your spouse, but if your spouse is really getting older too, you may want to name one of your kids 
or more of your kids. On that document, you can name several of them jointly and severally, so any one of them can handle your affairs. Regarding your healthcare proxy, you wanna make sure there's somebody there who can make medical decisions for you if you're not available or competent to do it. Uh, that's typically the spouse, but as you get older, you increasingly you may wanna name your child instead. It may be that your spouse doesn't wanna to have to deal with dealing with doctors all the time. If you get sick, you'd rather have one of your kids doing it. In the case of the healthcare proxy, you can only name one person at a time. There may be a set of people who, even though they're not named as your healthcare proxy, because once again, you can only name one at a time, you want to have participating in those decisions. In that case, you need to do HIPAA designations, so-called health, the Healthcare Portability and Accountability Act, which limits the ability of your doctors and your medical providers to talk to anybody about your situation unless you've specifically authorized them to do so. Once again, you can name a number of people to do that. Finally, there's the MOLST form. This is a form that would be signed by your doctor, by, but assented to by you, and you should talk to your doctor about it, that, that make, gives some orders about what should, be, what should happen, especially in an emergency situation. If, you, if your heart has stopped, do you really want folks to try to start it again, even though you know that you're frail and it's the, it's the last year of your life? Do you really want to go through that pain or do you want to die? Uh, if, you're, if you've stopped breathing, would you rather just stop breathing and die? Or do you really at that point want the doctors to try to make you start breathing again despite your other conditions? Do you want to die at home? In that case, on that form, the most form, you want to say that you do not want to be transported to a hospital if an EMT or somebody else, some other medical person shows up at your house because you've had an incident. You want to stay at home. So, so once you've done all that stuff, finally, have the conversation. Have the conversation with the people you've named as your healthcare proxy, as your power of attorney. Talk to folks about how you want to be treated during that last year of your life because during that time, you may not be competent to make those decisions. So these are the kinds of conversations you want to have ahead of time. The goal of all of this is to help you sleep at night. If there are, you have worries about any of these issues, you should address them. If you want to see, see this presentation or any of the others that I've done, you can always go to my YouTube channel, Elder Law, Frank and Mary. Thank you very, very much. And please let me know if you have any questions. My direct line is 508-860-1470. Thank you.